will address first the practical aspects of humanitarian principles. Um, we will look at what uh, their origins are, uh, what is the definition of these principles, and more importantly, uh, what is the, the use, the finality and the function of, uh, of those principles, including as much as possible from a very operational perspective. We will uh, we'll have with the participants uh, an exercise looking at some ethical dilemmas that uh, humanitarian organizations can face and regularly face on the ground. And with the participants, we'll look at how those humanitarian principles can help humanitarian organizations to address and overcome uh, those dilemmas or challenges that they inevitably face on the ground. I'm going to inject the legal dimension into the conversation. I'm going to start off by explaining the interplay between humanitarian principles and international humanitarian law, highlighting who the principles are addressed to, who international humanitarian law is addressed to, and also identify the sources of the humanitarian principles and instances in which they are specifically referred to in international humanitarian law. In the second part of my presentation, I am going to outline the law regulating one specific type of uh, humanitarian action, relief operations in situations of armed conflict, and I'm going to try and focus on two salient issues, the question of consent, whose consent is required before relief operations may be carried out, and secondly, the circumstances in which such consent may not be withheld. The humanitarian principles, what we call the core humanitarian principles guiding humanitarian action, are four. Um, it's humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence. Uh, and I will get into more details uh, on this in a minute, but I wanted to highlight uh, an important uh, difference between the fundamental principles of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement and the humanitarian principles. The fundamental principles of the Red Cross and Red Crescent are seven. They were adopted in 1965, I will get back to it, uh, and they deeply influenced the rest of the humanitarian sector, and indeed they were uh, adopted later on as the, those four principles guiding humanitarian action. The difference is uh, that we have those three additional principles within the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement that are voluntary service, unity, and universality. And I will get back to this in a second. But before that, uh, a few words about the origin of the, of the principles. Um, those humanitarian principles were, I mean, first appeared in a, in a in substance, on the, best, the battlefield of Solferino in 1859, uh, which, as you know, uh, marks the, the, the origin and the creation of the, of the Red Cross, and later on the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, when Henri Dunant, arriving on the, on the battlefield of Solferino, seeing like more than tens of thousands of people, of soldiers wounded on the battlefield, decided to mobilize people in the surrounding villages in this uh, uh, area of northern Italy uh, to come to, to the help of the wounded soldiers, and, uh, and to do that without any discrimination, uh, regardless of the, of the side of the, of the soldiers, and uh, that and that's the, the very origin of this very important principle of impartiality, which in a sense is about non-discrimination in the way we provide relief. Uh, it's only more than one century later, really, that those principles were formalized uh, as we know them today. In 1965, at the 20th International Conference of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement held in Vienna, the seven fundamental principles of the Red Cross that I have mentioned before were formally adopted. However, they didn't come out of the blue all of a sudden in uh, 1965. Uh, as I said, they, they first appeared somehow on the, sol on the, the battlefield of, of Solferino, but they were also the crystallization of one century of operational uh, practice, of field experience of the ICRC and the broader Red Cross and Red Crescent uh, movement. Um, Afterward, in, 
in 1991, through UN General Assembly Resolution 46182, uh, those principles, the first four principles of humanity, uh, the first three principles actually of humanity, impartiality, and neutrality were consecrated um, or recognized in this resolution of the, UNA the UN General Assembly as the principles that should guide humanitarian action. And in 2003, through resolution 58, 100, uh, 58, 114. Um, the, the principles of independence was added to those three principles that were first recognized in uh, 1991. And throughout the 1990s and then later in the 2000s, um, those principles were um, uh, increasingly recognized and uh, embraced by uh, the broader humanitarian sector, NGOs, UN, through the ad adoption of a number of uh, uh, codes of conduct, uh, NGO charters that uh, embedded those um, humanitarian principles in the policy and practice of, uh, of humanitarian actors. And uh, to mention but one, uh, I can uh, mention the code of conduct for the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement and NGOs in disaster relief, which is signed by more than 500 um, non-governmental organizations, uh, which really embed those, uh, those principles, those four humanitarian principles. And in the 2000s, a number of regional organizations have also um, recognized those principles in their own uh, policy documents, such as the European Consensus on Humanitarian Aid, which was adopted in 2008, uh, the ECOWAS humanitarian policy that was adopted a few years back that also recognized the importance of those principles, and so on and so forth. I, I could mention some others, but those are two uh, that uh, illustrate my, uh, my point. Let's get to the definition of, uh, of these principles. Um, first, I'm, I like to when introducing the, the principles to show this pyramid that represents the seven fundamental principles of the, of the Red Cross and not only the four core humanitarian principles as we know them. Um, because that's the, the way we understand these principles within the, the movement. And we, we like to represent them through this pyramid because it, gives the, uh, it reflects this notion of hierarchy within the principles. All the principles are not uh, do not have the same finality, all the principles do not have the same value, even though they are deeply interlinked and they should be used as a, as a whole. And basically, I will stand up here, um, humanity and impartiality were described by Jean Pictet, whom you know well uh, because of the work he did on the, the, the commentaries of, um, uh, of the Geneva Conventions. Jean Pictet also commented those principles of the, of the Red Cross, and he said that humanity and impartiality are what he called substantive principles, meaning they, they belong to the domain of, uh, to the realm of, uh, of goals. This is the, uh, the, the very essence of uh, humanitarian action. This is what we aim for. Then neutrality and, and independence have a different character. They are tools, they are operational tools for action that enable um, impartial humanitarian action, which is our goal. And then those three principles uh, of voluntary service, unity, and universality that are uh, unique to the, uh, to, to the movement, the way they are at least uh, understood within the movement, are institutional in character. They provide the institutional foundations within the movement to enable the application of the other principles. Just one example is unity. The, the way we understand unity within the movement is that there should be one national society per country, it should be open to all, and it should cover the entirety of the, of the territory. And this is not the condition, but it certainly facilitates enable national societies to deliver impartial aid throughout the territory. And by reflecting the diversity of the population, ethnic, religious, cultural, social, it also arguably um, enable them to remain neutral or perceived as neutral should the situation deteriorate and the conflict break out in a given country. Now, let's get to, um, to each principle relatively briefly, but still. Humanity, uh, the essential principle um, of humanitarian action. It's really the, uh, it set the purpose, the sole purpose of humanitarian action, which is to prevent and alleviate suffering of people affected by humanitarian crises, but also to protect life and ensure respect for human dignity. There are three important aspects that can be drawn uh, from it. 
First, humanity represented, it represents a, a deep belief in the sacredness of human life and, uh, and the equality of human beings. So a corollary of this, uh, of this principle is the idea of non-discrimination that I have, I have already mentioned uh, in reference to, uh, to Solferino. Um, then in our understanding of the principle of humanity within at least the, the, the ICRC, uh, it requires us to work really in proximity with, uh, with the people we are serving, with the people, we, uh, we, the people uh, affected by crisis, and to develop a human relationship with them, because it's more than delivering just assistance. It's indeed about respecting their dignity, therefore having this uh, human relationship with them, being able to, to listen to their concerns, uh, to understand their situation, and to try to, to bring a response that is adapted, but also, also culturally uh, uh, adapted. And then the, the last important point is that uh, humanitarian action encompasses not not only uh, assistance, material assistance, health, uh, food, shelter, but also protection activities, ensuring that people's rights under IHL, under uh, international human rights law, refugee law, and so on and so forth, is respected. Impartiality. As I said, impartiality is still a substantive principle. It's, it still belongs to the domain of, uh, of goals, and uh, it's kind of corollary to the principle of humanity. Indeed, this idea of non-discrimination, which is one of the components of the principle of impartiality, is, is key and is uh, an integral part of this, uh, this ideal of, uh, of humanity. And uh, it is to, uh, non-discrimination means to make sure that relief action will be um, given, delivered, um, uh, regardless of the, 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 the political uh, sympathies of people, regardless of their race, of, their, of the side they belong to, their religion, their gender, and so on and so forth. And aid should be based only on needs, on an objective assessment of needs, which is this principle of proportiona proportionality. It should be um, uh, delivered based on the urgency and the severity of needs. And then a third component of impartiality is the exclusion of personal bias. It means that as an individual relief worker, you have to put aside uh, maybe your, your personal feeling toward one individual because he's a member of your family, your cousin, or because he's part of your same ethnic group, but really try to address the needs only based on the proportionality of the needs and without any other discrimination. Then we get, we get in the domain of uh, means, means to an end, operational tools, neutrality. Uh, the way neutrality is defined within the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, uh, it starts with this phrase, in order to continue to enjoy the confidence of all. So here we see that neutrality is almost utilitarian. The finality is to gain the trust uh, of people, the confidence of people that enable us to deliver impartial humanitarian aid. It has two main aspects. One is military neutrality, which is not taking side in hostilities, but also making sure that the aid we provide doesn't support, even inadvertently as much as possible, any parties to a conflict. And then there is the notion of uh, the, uh, the aspect of ideological and religious neutrality, which is to abstain, to uh, engage in uh, in controversies of uh, uh, religious, political uh, nature, to make sure that we do not antagonize any side, but also any segment of the, of the population, in order to continue to enjoy the confidence of all and to enable us to, to work on the field in proximity with the people. And the corollary to neutrality is independence. And independence is about maintaining the autonomy from any parties to uh, any third party in a given conflict, the um, uh, political, economic, or, um, uh, or military interest of any party in a, in a given conflict. Uh, that includes, um, uh, in the ICRC practice, and in the Red Cross, Red Cross 
practice to maintain some, uh, some autonomy from the United Nations, for instance, in some context where the United Nations are deeply politically involved, uh, given the, the, the mandate given by the UN Security Council, for instance. It, um, it involves um, maintaining some autonomy from our donors, institutional donors, states, um, and uh, that result in um, our insistence, for instance, to, uh, um, uh, to, to get non-earmarked earmarked funding so that we remain autonomous in the way we direct uh, the, the assistance and protection that, uh, that we deliver. I realize that time is running, so we'll try to uh, move on a bit uh, more quickly to the, the function of the principle, the finality of those principles. As I mentioned, those humanitarian principles provide both an ethical and an operational framework for humanitarian action. Humanity and impartiality provide this moral compass, whereas neutrality and independence are really about uh, enabling us in the field, given the, 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 the actual circumstances we operate in and given the, the politics of the situations in which we work, to, to navigate those complexities and to deliver this impartial aid. And Indeed, the neutrality and independence, uh, as mentioned before, are really made, made to ensure acceptance by all. And um, this is the, 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 the foundation for this acceptance-based access uh, and approach to humanitarian action by working on the perception of people, by ensuring that we are seen and perceived as neutral and independent from any political or economic stakes. We ensure the, the acceptance of the authorities, of arms carriers, of the communities themselves, uh, which itself is necessary to gain access, not always enough, but uh, certainly a precondition to, to get access, and that enable action that is relevant to the, to the people, so by, being, uh, by working in proximity with the people, which is itself, uh, by making sure the, the, the aid and the programs that we deliver are relevant to the people, it uh, it affects also positively the perception, and then you have this kind of virtuous circle. And for this, dialogue is critical. And dialogue with all parties concerned, including non-state armed groups. Uh, and for this, it is important that in the first place we are seen as neutral and independent to have access to those, uh, uh, to those different armed groups, being uh, governmental, non-governmental. Um, and also, I mean, but this ability to, uh, to have dialogue can be affected by, for instance, uh, counter-terrorism measures or policies that would restrict the ability of humanitarian organizations to, um, uh, to, to have a dialogue and to engage with uh, those different uh, groups. The operational relevance of those principles and here, when talking about the humanitarian principles, we talk about humanity, impartiality, neutrality and independence. And as far as the movement is concerned, we have three other principles that, form the, the, that are part of the seven fundamental principles of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement. Uh, but focusing on those four core principles that I just mentioned, the, the operational relevance is huge because they both provide uh, uh, could call it a moral compass for humanitarian action. Uh, that's the, uh, they represent the motivation behind humanitarian action, the objective of humani humanitarian action, which is to alleviate suffering and to protect life and respect dignity of people affected by crisis. And to do so in a non-discriminatory manner, meaning regardless of the race, the religion, uh, the, 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 the political allegiance or the gender, but only based on the needs. So those aspects, uh, those fundamental aspects that give the, um, the compass for humanitarian action are encapsulated in the principles of humanity and impartiality. Then we come to the other principles of neutrality and independence that are much more operational in nature. They, they are not ends in themselves, not goals. They are means to an end, means to implement impartial humanitarian action, even in some of the most uh, complex, polarized situations of conflict, of today's conflict.
and, uh, and they remain as relevant as ever because indeed it's um, by being perceived as neutral uh, from all parties to conflict, by abstaining to engage in controversies of a an ideological or religious nature that we manage to man maintain the trust of the, of the people, of the parties to a conflict, but also of the communities themselves that enable us to, uh, to work in proximity with them. And it's by being perceived as independent from other political or even economic, security or military agendas that we can also ensure uh, this trust and this acceptance, which is the very condition to deliver impartial humanitarian aid. I'm going to just try and set the scene a bit in terms of the interplay between humanitarian principles and international humanitarian law. It's ex something that's extremely important to understand, but all too frequently confused. And let's start with basic. Let's kick off by trying to agree on what they are. Um, IHL, as you know, is the body of rules applicable in times of armed conflict that regulates means a method of warfare, protects those not or no longer taking direct part in hostilities. It's directly binding on states and organized armed groups. Humanitarian principles, as Jeremy just pointed out, provide guidance to those who wish to carry out humanitarian activity, be it protection or assistance, in times of armed conflict. They're not binding, and they're addressed to those who want to carry out relief activities. What do the humanitarian principles aim to do? As Jeremy pointed out, I, I see essentially two purposes. First, promote a way of operating that provides assurance to parties to an armed conflict that humanitarian activities do not interfere in the conflict or provide an advantage to their opponent. Compliance with humanitarian principles makes it more likely that operations are going to be accepted by everyone and that they can be carried out in a manner that is unimpeded and also safe. Safe for those carrying them out and safe for the beneficiaries. The second objective of the humanitarian principles is to ensure that beneficiaries received the assistance they need in a manner that is not discriminatory and that reaches those most in need, principle of impartiality. So this is what they are, word humanitarian in both of them, but they're different things with different purposes. Now let's look at them a little more closely. And I find that there are two points that really help understand the interplay between IHL and humanitarian principles, who they're addressed to and what their sources are. So who are they addressed to? IHL principally to parties to an armed conflict, to states and to organized armed groups. Humanitarian principles to those wishing to carry out humanitarian action. This seems pretty evident, but it's often confused. Now, if we look at some of the instruments that Jeremy just mentioned, we're going to have confirmation of this. So for example, the proclamation of 65 sets out the fundamental principles on which Red Cross action is based, i.e. the action of the components of the movements, the ICRC, the Federation, and national societies. Similarly, within the United Nations context, General Assembly Resolution 46182 lays down the framework for strengthening and coordinating emergency humanitarian assistance of the UN, states that humanitarian assistance must be provided in accordance with the principles of humanity, neutrality, and impartiality. So we have a resolution, a General Assembly resolution adopted by states, but it's not about how states must behave. It's about the behavior of those who want to provide humanitarian assistance. We're running a bit late. I had a number of examples of how the Security Council has addressed humanitarian principles. Um, and it's interesting to see, because as is the case on a number of other issues, the, IA, uh, the Security Council is not consistent in the terminology it uses, and often 
actually doesn't get things right in relation to humanitarian principles and calls upon state parties to comply with them. I won't go through them now, but perhaps we can go through them later. Um, so, as I said, the principles are addressed to those who want to carry out humanitarian action. It's inaccurate and makes no sense to ask parties to an armed conflict to comply with humanitarian principles. They have to comply with their obligations under IHL in times of armed conflict. But it's not incumbent upon parties to an armed conflict to comply with the humanitarian principles. However, they must not prevent those carrying out humanitarian action from doing so in a principled manner. That's the role of parties to an armed conflict vis-a-vis -vis the humanitarian principles. Don't prevent humanitarian actors from operating in a principled manner. Admittedly, some of the same values underlying humanitarian principles also underlie some of the obligations of parties to an armed conflict. And uh, you'll have seen the words, I'm thinking in particular of humanity and non-discrimination. These are words, concepts that we find in international humanitarian law and also in human rights law and also in refugee law. But this doesn't mean that the parties to an armed conflict must comply with humanitarian principles. IHL is not the source of the principles. Rather, I think it's an indication of the importance of these values in times of armed conflict and how it is incumbent on a range of different actors to respect them in different ways. So it's for those carrying out humanitarian action who should comply with the principles for the operational reasons we discussed earlier, because it makes it more likely that they'll be allowed to operate in a manner that is safe and unimpeded. Why do I say should? Because the principles are not binding, or at least not binding per se. Um, and why do I say per se, per se? And this takes me to my, my second point, which is the source of the humanitarian principles. And all too frequently, um, there's an assumption that the source of the principles is international humanitarian law. And this is not correct. As Jeremy has just pointed out, as far as the components of the Red Cross, Red Crescent movements are concerned, the, funda um, the fundamental principles were proclaimed by the Red Cross Conference in 65. The components of the movement must comply with these principles as a matter of internal movement obligations. That's why they're binding of them and act uh, in accordance with them. However, the conference itself is not the source of the principles. We actually had an interesting conversation as to why this proclamation, why this strange term, why didn't it just adopt the principles? It definitely laid down definitions of the principles that have been used since then by the movement and also beyond. But it wasn't the source of the principles. In fact, as Jeremy also pointed out, some of the, the fundamental principles were in fact already referred to in the Geneva Convention, so 49. So while the Geneva Conventions, the additional protocols are not the source of the principles, they do refer to them. And, um, at the moment, I'm an academic, I have time to do things like word searches, things that I'd love to do in my office job but can't. So I did a word search of the Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols to see which of the fundamental principles came up. And neutrality comes up, but in essentially in dealing with states that are not parties to the armed conflict. Independence does not come up at all, but it is humanity slash humanitarian and um, impartial that are the principles that, you al that also appear in, uh, in IHL. And when do we see these terms? When IHL instruments identify particular tasks, particular activities that may be carried out by actors that operate in accordance for these, with these principles. And for the most part, but not exclusively, they relate to relief operations. So just one example, Article 59 of the Fourth Geneva Convention on relief operations in situations of occupation states, and I'm paraphrasing, 
I'm paraphrasing, states that if the whole or part of the population of an occupied territory is inadequately supplied, the occupying power shall agree to relief schemes um, carried out by impartial humanitarian organizations. So that's where we have a reference in IHL to the principles. And there's a number of other ones, I won't go into them now, Article 70 of Additional Protocol 1, Article 18.2 of Additional Protocol 2, I'll come to these later, and Common Article 3, which is um, actually broader in nature because it foresees the possibility of offers of services more broadly, so assistance and protection being made by an impartial humanitarian body such as the ICRC. So another reference in IHL to the principles. So if we go back, I have two minutes, one minute and a half. Um, if we go back to my initial question, um, are they binding? What are the consequences of not complying with principles as a matter of law? Um, well, an actor that doesn't comply with the principles doesn't benefit from the provisions in question. And so here's one example. Article 70 of Additional Protocol 1 provides that if the civilian population is not adequately provided with certain essential surprise, Relief actions that are humanitarian and impartial in character and conducted without any adverse distinction shall be undertaken. So, um, what does this mean? It means even if we're in a circumstance where there is a situation where there are civilians whose needs are not met, um, the rules requiring parties to accept offers only come into play in relation to offers coming from parties that operate in a principled manner. If, you, if a humanitarian actor does not operate in a principled manner, in a manner that uh, is humanitarian and impartial, the state does not need to consider its offer of services. So that's a bit the interplay between principles and IHL. Operating in a principled manner opens the door to specific provisions of IHL for those actors that operate in a principled manner. Who decides whether an actor operates in a principled manner? Good question. It is essentially the party to whom the offers are made. On what basis? Past practice. Definitely not lip service. Afternoon, and thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, this might sound somewhat heretical to a question to pose uh, at the Red Cross here in Geneva, but I, I was just wondering um, how negotiable the principles are. Um, okay, the humanity, impartiality, very much fundamental. Is there a possibility at all to add an additional principle? I'm asking this question because there were consultations here last week ahead of the World Humanitarian Summit in May next year, and one proposal was to introduce a principle of subsidiarity, uh, which was heavily criticized by, by many, but I was just wondering about how flexible the, the principles are in that regard, uh, whether there's a need for, for, for that recognition of that particular principle. And, and my second question was, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear more about how the Security Council has understood or misunderstood the principles. Thank you. It's interesting, we were actually at a meeting last week also on, on, on the principles and that very point about subsidiarity came up. And I think it, we, we should go back to um, Jeremy's pyramid there because we've got three things that I think really are fundamental principles that, that guide the way we act. Um, that, are, that set out the values. And then, to me, subsidiarity, where does it fit into that, that particular pyramid? It's a way of operating. And we mustn't confuse things. There's a lot of operating modalities that we can agree would be useful in a particular context across the board if we all agreed to them. But I don't think that they are at the same level um, as the actual humanitarian principles of humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence. They're much more operational um, in practice, in nature. I don't know if you want to add to that while I look for my Security Council language. Yes, just adding on the, are, are they uh, negotiable? Can we add some principles to it? Uh, and subsidiarity. 
Clearly, I mean, those seven fundamental principles, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a set of principles that bind movement components, and, uh, and definitely in that regard, we, we think that, I mean, they remain relevant. We carried out a number of uh, workshops within the, the, the international movement uh, this year, and uh, the unanimous conclusion was that, well, th there was no need to touch them, we just need to uh, always endeavor to better apply them. Uh, but then the f those principles have a certain flexibility as well. As I said, it, it's no dogma, except maybe humanity and impartiality, that is really the bottom line. And uh, I would dare to say that it's the, uh, we see this as the, the bottom line for humanitarian action. If you do not satisfy the principles of humanity and impartiality, uh, then you are not humanitarian, I would dare to say. However, neutrality and independence are more, as I, say, as I said, tools. And therefore, there are circumstances in which they are maybe less critical uh, to respect strictly. Like in a natural disaster, uh, when a military uh, might be the only one able to provide enough planes or uh, like a heavy, um, heavy, uh, you know, whatever, um, inf infrastructures to, to address the, the needs. What's the point not working with them? Yet we, we need to maintain some consistency and, uh, and our number of natural disasters that happen in situations where there is also a conflict. So it's not always easy. But, uh, uh, and on subsidiarity, maybe one last very quick point. Um, the, the way it was proposed in the, in the context of the, uh, the World Humanitarian Summit, uh, it was just to remind everybody that maybe if there is something missing in, the, uh, in those four core humanitarian principles, it's this kind of institutional foundation that we have within the movement. Hence the idea of subsidiarity. I don't know whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, but it was to, to say, well, we should recognize that within humanitarian action, uh, some local actors sometimes have some comparative advantages over international actors, but also the other way around. And we should be very much aware of the ability of each to abide by those principles and recognize where the limits are and, uh, and fully acknowledge what other actors can do in order to work in a complementary fashion. On the Security Council point, um, something I used to have to do in my old job at Otra in New York was to try and get the Security Council to adopt language on IHL, on protection of civilians, on humanitarian principle that was accurate and, and relevant. And it was interesting that in recent years, it also turned to humanitarian principles. And we could have a whole conversation as to whether it's a good idea for a political body like the Security Council to get involved in humanitarian principles. That's, that's another can of worms. But what we found, in fact, again, preparing for, for here, I went through the language it had adopted recently, and as is frequently the case, it has just not been consistent nor necessarily accurate. So I've got um, a PRST, a presidential statement of uh, 2013, where the Security Council calls on all parties to the conflict to respect the UN guiding principles of humanitarian, humanitarian emergency assistance. So it's a bit odd calling on state parties to respect the principles, but maybe there's, there's a step missing, which is state parties allow others to operate in a principled manner. We have language, and I'm looking at the Security Council resolution uh, of 2013, where the Council emphasizes the need for all parties to an armed conflict to uphold and respect the humanitarian principles uphold and respect. Maybe I've, something's lost in translation, but when I googled uphold, it, it didn't help. It means maintain. You don't maintain the principles. Um, just, um, in fact, um, another one, calling upon all parties to respect the impartiality. Ah, this is language I like, actually. Calling upon all parties in the conflict to respect the impartiality, independence, and neutrality of humanitarian actors. This is in a resolution of last year, um, Yunus, uh, Monusco, on, uh, on the DRC. And that's, I think, the occasion on which the Security Council has got it most accurate. Call upon all parties to the conflict to respect impartiality, independence, and neutrality of the humanitarian actors. I will ask you for a few minutes, and we don't have much time, like we'll take five, ten minutes, to put, your, to put yourself in the skin of a director of operations of a major international humanitarian organization. Uh, 
and you are not a legal advisor. Please forget about this for a few minutes. And remember, there is also rarely a clearly right or wrong answer. That's the very essence of a dilemma. So indeed, do not hesitate to, um, uh, to state what you think about those dilemmas. Your organization, your director of operations, has been active for years in a country affected by civil war between the government and the rebellion in the remote west of the country. Your NGO has been able so far to maintain access, although it regularly suffers from restrictions imposed by the government. But it does have access. Not easy, but it has access. As the violence increases, the government faces growing international condemnation for its military tactics that severely impacts the civilian population. Maybe the use of torture, for instance, massively. A petition has been launched by some NGOs asking for the government to be brought in front of the International Criminal Court. And your colleague, the Communication and Advocacy Director, wants definitely your organization to sign the petition. Please, by raising your hand, do you think this is acceptable to sign this petition? Who thinks it's acceptable as a director of operations, having the principles in mind? Nobody? So raise your hand, those thinking that it's inacceptable. Well, well close to consensus, there are a few that are like um, on, the, on the line, not quite sure. Uh, so maybe, why do you see this as, uh, or in order to know why you think it's inacceptable, mostly what, are, what principles are at stake in, uh, in this uh, instance? And here I think uh, we are getting to, to your question. What are the principles at stake here? Impartiality. Neutrality, impartiality. Is humanity at stake? Indeed, all are at stake, one way or another, but maybe those that are the most directly at stake and maybe intention, and here we get to your, uh, to your question, are certainly humanity and this, uh, this kind of moral imperative to do something, including uh, to ensure greater protection of the civilian population that suffers, and increasingly so, in this conflict, and then neutrality. I think, I mean, somebody mentioned neutrality. Why, why is it at stake? Who would like to, to react on this? Well, it's a political issue. Um, it's a, I, I repeat, maybe for those who haven't heard, maybe it's a political issue, and so that goes against uh, neutrality. But why is like uh, seizing the, the International Criminal Court, is it a political issue? So I would say two things. One, there's a difference between the means and the ends. So I think the ICRC's means or neutrality means, even though it is to advance, of course, justice and accountability and everything, the way it works is uh, undercover and not really publicly and so sort of engages with the parties and res and gets results. That's one thing, the, the difference between the means and the ends. And the second thing is that uh, although fighting impunity or ending impunity is not political in itself, there's there are different stages of the uh, international criminal process. And for example, if you see the ICRC, actually I wanted to raise that as a question, so it's nice that we have it now. The ICRC's position on... Uh, giving testimony in front of, I don't know, the ICTY, etc. There have been several very well-known cases and that put the ICRC in a very difficult position. So you can say that giving a te testimony, even witness testimony, can be political, but because of this principle of neutrality, the ICRC asked to be uh, sort of alleviated from the legal, completely legal obligation. So if, if that's right within the, the absolutely criminal process, of course it will be right at the, the first stage of petition where the criminal professionals or international criminal professionals still haven't said anything about it. So. Yes, indeed, that's a very important point that, uh, that you raised. I will come back to you in, a, in one second. Uh, indeed, for the ASRC, considering that uh, the importance that neutrality and being perceived as a neutral party has in our action. We indeed uh, manage to get these immunities of uh, testimony, I mean, you would use a more correct word than, uh, than me, uh, in front of the, the ACC and uh, some international criminal jurisdiction. And for us, it's essential or critical in order to carry out uh, uh, our work. But well, 
so thanks for bringing this up. Uh, what I wanted to, to raise here is this typical dilemma between indeed uh, uh, um, humanitarian action and, and justice. And both satisfy this ideal of humanity, uh, however, justice, as you rightly uh, pointed out, creates some tensions with our ability to be accepted by all. I mean, justice, uh, 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 well, the, the International Criminal Court, for instance, an indictment by the International Criminal Court may be perceived as a political act, as it was in the past in uh, some countries. I mean, you all have in mind Sudan, uh, certainly, where this resulted in the eviction of, uh, this kind of situation resulted in the eviction of um, 16 or 17 uh, non-governmental organizations. Manu, did you want to react? I was just going to, um, this particular conversation yeah, that works. Struck, um, struck me that perhaps we should have said something right at the outset, which is what organizations should comply with the principles, not every NGO should comply with them. It depends what you want to do. It's those wishing to carry out humanitarian action, so provide relief, carry out some very specific um, protection activities in the field. If you want to carry those out, it's, it, it's a very good idea for you to comply with the principles and, as you point out, be seen, be perceived as complying with them. Someone mentioned um, an, NGO, an NGO that engages in human rights advocacy. Obviously, that strives towards the same end goal of promoting compliance with the law, but it goes about it in a very different way. It faces very different challenges. It doesn't have operations in the field that a party that feels aggrieved by the way you've behaved can just interrupt. So. Let, let's bear it in mind. It's not as if they are principles of how NGOs should behave. They are addressed and relevant to those who want to carry out particular activities that require them to be close to people in the field. But I think this is a very interesting conversation that we're having on how different actors who have the same ultimate common goal of providing protection by compliance with the law should engage with accountability mechanisms. We've mentioned the ICC, ICTY. What about sanctions mechanisms? Increasingly, they are going to actors in the field to figure out not just how the sanctions, whether the sanctions are having a humanitarian impact, but also who are the violators, who's committing violations. If you are an actor in the field, do you engage with them? A very live question that different actors have a different reply to. ICRC is very lucky. I used to be ICRC. It was very lucky. It was very easy to say, sorry, but no. When I was at the UN, we were in a far more complex position because we have to cooperate with the ICC, for example, but we still have operations in the field. How do you balance this? Right, and that's precisely why it is so critical for organizations to be also honest about their own limitations. As we said before, being neutral and independent, it's not an end in itself. It enables us to carry out our humanitarian mission and to do so in an impartial manner by being accepted uh, by the parties in a, in a given conflict. When organizations, either uh, because of uh, external constraints or because of institutional choices, uh, decide to take some positions, for instance, that would be at odds with neutrality, uh, is it not a humanitarian organization anymore? I uh, wouldn't be well placed to say that. It might be that in the particular uh, circumstances, uh, they have anyway a very restricted access, they do not manage to have access, and in their calculus, they consider that in order to contribute to the protection of these people, maybe Yes, that could, that could help to this uh, ultimate protection objective. Yet, then we would expect those actors uh, to be more honest and transparent about those decisions and then uh, to recognize that in this particular case they, they, they are not seen and perceived as, as neutral and, uh, and that they, they, they are not delivering this neutral and independent humanitarian action rather than contribute to this blurring of lines between organizations. We are a very diverse lot of actors and uh, very complementary too, but with um, each one more or less in a, not in the same position to abide by all those principles that we are discussing today. to um, spend a few minutes 
um, outlining the law regulating one type of humanitarian action, humanitarian relief operations. Um, and um, the rules regulating humanitarian relief operations, humanitarian assistance, a simple and essentially the same in international and non-international armed conflict. So primary responsibility for meeting the needs of civilians lies with the party to the conflict that has control over them. I am grossly simplifying. We could have a week's seminar just on this, so I'm going to grossly simplify. If that party with responsibility to meet the needs of the civilian populations fails to do so, states and, international and humanitarian organizations may offer to carry out relief operations. And I think this sequencing is important. There's always a tendency by humanitarian organizations to want to rush in. It's like, hold on, let the party to the conflict see whether it can meet the needs, yes or no. Um, in the majority of cases, the consent of affected states is required but may not be arbitrarily withheld. There are two situations in which consent, uh, states have no latitude to withhold consent. The first is situations of occupation, and the second are situations where the Security Council has taken a binding decision imposing relief operations. And I say imposing rather than authorizing, because I don't want to have an unfortunate precedent where if the Security Council has not imposed them, a party can somehow say, I have no obligation to allow them. Once relief operations have been agreed to, all parties must allow and facilitate rapid and unimpeded passage of release consignments, but they may impose technical arrangements under which such passage is um, allowed. Now, normally, operationally, it is at this stage of the game that most of the problems arise. A party to the conflict has said, yes, of course, you can come in and carry out relief operations, but in practice, it, um, it makes it extremely difficult for the relief operations to be carried out. That said, in, in the few minutes that remain today, I'm going to focus on two central legal questions that arise at an earlier stage of the process and that have received considerable attention in recent years. The first question is, I say consent is required, but whose consent? And the second question I've said is consent is required not to be arbitrarily withheld. What amounts to an arbitrary withholding of consent to offers to carry out relief operations? Another key legal question which has arisen with immediate operational consequences are, what are the consequences when a party um, arbitrarily withholds consent? Can unauthorized operations be carried out? That is a question that's not addressed by IHL, but rather by other bodies of international law, and maybe something we can turn in to uh, discuss um, later. So first and foremost, whose consent is required? And here I'm talking about the initial green light to operate in a particular context. It's clear this is required, but it's less clear, at least in relation to non-international armed conflict, whose consent is required. So if we look at international armed conflict, um, Article 70 of Additional Protocol 1 requires the consent of the parties concerned in the relief actions. This is in the plural. And this, position, this, uh, this provision refers to, most notably, the state party to the conflict in whose territory you want to carry out the relief operation. Cons their consent is required. Pretty simple. The position in non-international armed conflict is more complex. Um, and in fact, there are two different provisions that are of direct relevance to this. The first is Common Article 3.2 of the Geneva Conventions that I mentioned earlier. And this provides that an impartial humanitarian body, linked back to our principles, may offer its services to the parties to the conflict. It is entitled to offer them to either side, the state and the organized armed group. However, it's silent as to whose consent is required in order to carry out the relief operations. Some have interpreted Article 3.2 as implicitly allowing relief operations to be carried out if the party to whom you have made your offer accepts it. The, the, the consent of the other side um, is not required. 
provided, of course, that your relief operations don't have to carry a transit through territory controlled by your enemy. If you can get there directly, some say all that is required is the consent of the party to whom you've made the offer. I have to say, I find it difficult to interpret the silence of Article 3.2 in this particular way. Um, I think it, it really leads to a significant infringement of state sovereignty to say, I've made an offer to the organized armed group. I can reach that, the, the territory controlled by the organized armed group directly. Therefore, your consent is not required. At best, this approach would only apply to the organizations, the actors specifically referred to in common article three, so impartial humanitarian organizations. All other actors wishing to carry out relief operations would have to comply with the more stringent requirements in article 18.2. And Article 18.2 of Additional Protocol 2 is more explicit on this point. It requires the consent of the high contracting party concerned, end of quote. This appears to be a clear reference to the state party, to the non-international armed conflict, the high contracting party concerned. However, it has been suggested by some that a high contracting party, that a state, is concerned by relief operations, only if they have to transit through territory under its control. If somehow the territory um, controlled by the opposition, by the rebel group, can be reached directly from neighboring states, the state is not concerned by the relief operations, and therefore its consent is not required. Um, again, I have to say, I'm a bit of a positive di uh, dinosaur, I have to say, I find this interpretation of Article 18.2 a bit problematic. Um, I have to say, the suggestion that a state is only concerned by activities being carried out in its territory um, is not concerned by activities being carried out in its territory if they can be carried out by neighboring states, just is contrary to... Um, basic considerations of territorial sovereignty. It just doesn't make sense to me. Also, more literally, this means that although we have a reference to the high contracting party concerned, there may be instances in which, in fact, there is no high contracting party consent, concerned, which I think is, is, counter, is a counterintuitive reading of the express language of Article 18.2. So where does this leave us? I have to say, in light of the silence of Article 3 on this specific issue of whose consent is required, and the specific reference to the high contracting party in Article 18.2 to the state, I think a view that gives due weight to general principles of international law relating to state sovereignty and also to a state's um, obligations towards the civilian population would be to say that the consent of the state is always required, even in relation to relief operations that can be carried out from neighboring states, but that in those circumstances, the state would have a narrower range of grounds for withholding consent. They need to be much more closely and directly linked to the territory in question, the territory under control of the opposition. For example, withholding concern out of concern, withholding consent out of concerns that the relief operations could somehow legitimize the opposition would be arbitrary, or cement its control of territory that would also be an arbitrary ground for withholding consent in those circumstances. So my conclusion would be the consent of the state is always required, but it's got a narrow round range of grounds for withholding consent. This is the law, and I'm looking at our colleague from Colombia, which, who's always very usefully bringing us to the operational realities. What are the operational realities in practice? Whatever the law says, it's, you would not go and carry out relief operations without the agreement of all the parties to the conflict through whose territory you go, because doing so would put you, your operations, and the very people you're trying to assist at risk. So there's a very clear difference between the legal position and what you would do operationally. The second question that I wanted to, to go through with you today and, um, is 
um, what amounts to arbitrary withholding of consent. Now, even though we have very clear language in Article 70 AP1 and Article 18 AP2 that consent is required, it was already understood at the time of the negotiations that parties didn't have an absolute and unlimited freedom to refuse to agree to relief operations. A party refusing consent had to do so for valid reasons, and I'm quoting here from the, the commentaries, not for arbitrary or capricious ones, which makes sense, but the problem is that um, um, we don't actually find any definition of, or even guidance in treaty law, of what amounts to an arbitrary withholding of consent. And this is a point that has not been addressed by any national or international tribunal or human rights mechanism. So let's try and unpack it. And perhaps I'll, I'll share my thinking at the moment and then see if you can add other grounds. Um, I think it's, it's very useful to look at international law more broadly, not just um, IHL, to see what is understood by arbitrary. And human rights law in particular, and also general principles of public international law, provide some guidance um, on the type of conduct that would be arbitrary um, and circumstances in which withholding consent would be arbitrary. Essentially, it is in three situations. First, if it's withheld in circumstances that would violate a party's other obligations under international law towards the civilian population in question. Secondly, if withholding consent violates the principles of necessity and proportionality. And thirdly, if consent is withheld in a manner um, that is unreasonable, unjust, lacking in predictability, or otherwise inappropriate. Now, if we quickly look at the three different possible headings in turn. Um, when do you think that withholding consent could violate a party's other obligations towards the civilian population? When it would violate human rights law, and in particular? Right to life, right to health, right to um, normal circumstances of life, like infrastructure and things like that. Uh, any particular other provisions under IHL? Sorry? That would be a circum. That might be a, um, a circumstance. Exactly. On. Absolutely, the prohibition of starvation of the civilian population. So that's exactly the the kind of thinking I intuitively started off from IHL, and I said, okay, sorry, go ahead. Can we also see, uh, connect with the grave breach, because sometimes the judicial guarantees are arbitrarily not, not provided, but in case of uh, humanitarian law, uh, it is the most. And yep. same as also in NIAC, in Common Article 3. Yeah, and I'm kind of focusing, I think you're looking more broadly at humanitarian action, I'm kind of focusing very much on relief operations, assistance. So in what circumstances would saying no to an offer of assistance um, violate a party's other obligations under international law. And yes, under IHL, it would be when the population is facing starvation and a party says, no, relief goods cannot come in. That's one example. Another example that comes to mind is um, um, withholding consent to medical operations, um, including on the ground that medical goods could be used to treat wounded enemy combatants. As you know, the wounded and sick, including enemy combatants, must receive to the fullest extent practical and with the least possible delay the medical care required by their condition. And no distinction may be made on the provision of health care other than on medical grounds. So withholding consent to medical relief on operations on the ground that they could assist enemy combatants would violate this rule. The same medical goods are also likely to be needed for the civilian population, and withholding consent in those circumstances would also violate civilians' entitlement to, to medical care. Another um, possible ground is selective withholding of consent with the intent of discriminating against a particular group. So, for example, systematically rejecting offers of assistance for regions populated by ethnic groups perceived as favoring the enemy. This would be a violation of the principle of the prohibition on non-discrimination. So these have kind of 
plucked from IHL. And then, as you correctly said, there's also um, international humanitarian law that is relevant. So withholding consent um, in situations that violates fundamental human rights, most notably the right to physical integrity, and also um, we mentioned economic, social, and cultural rights, situations where it prevents the satisfaction of the minimum core of these rights, the rights to um, um, an adequate standard of living, including food and water and health and medical services. That would be one another instance in which withholding consent would violate um, I've got one minute, I'm going to get to the end, and then you've got the first question. <laughs> um, would violate a state's other obligations, would be arbitrary because it violates their other obligations. The second heading was uh, withholding of consent in the violation of the principles of necessity and proportionality. And here I'm thinking of the principles of necessity and proportionality um, as expressed in international human rights law. So even where consent is withheld for a legitimate ground, it'll nonetheless be arbitrary if it exceeds what's necessary in the circumstances. So limitations in terms of time, duration, location, and affected goods and services must not go beyond what is absolutely necessary to achieve the legitimate aim. So while it might be acceptable perhaps at the outset of hostilities to say, no, hold on, no relief operations coming in, it would no longer be acceptable after one week. Or while it might be acceptable to say there is hot fighting in this particular area, therefore no relief operations, it wouldn't be acceptable to say and therefore no activities in the rest of the country. It's an ongoing assessment that needs to be carried out. And thirdly, my, my third heading focuses on the manner in which consent is withheld. And um, it would be arbitrary if it is done in a manner that's unreasonable or inappropriate or could lead to injustice or lack of predictability. And uh, I suppose one very clear example of this would be circumstances where consent is withheld without providing any reasons for this. So it's not clear the process for providing reasons is not clear. Do you have to provide them to each individual actor that makes an offer? Yes or no? It's honestly not clear in the law. However, what is clear is if there's a blanket refusal of accepting relief operations without the provision of any reasons, this would be arbitrary. Why? Essentially, it wouldn't allow us to even assess whether the grounds are legitimate, legitimate yes or no. You just don't know why you are prevented from carrying out relief operations. So withholding consent without providing any reasons would give rise to a rebuttable presumption of arbitrariness. There's a question over there. I was interesting, uh, interested in your opinion about the um, definition of the relief itself. Because if you look at it from the um, IHL perspective and Geneva Conventions, we have the commentaries and there is more or less for the ICRC, let's say at least. But if you um, include in the interpretation and definition of the um, relief supplies for the, for the perspective of state granting the consent, from human rights perspective, I think uh, through ICCPR, it's still okay because you will be talking about right to life and inhuman treatment. But as soon as you go to social, economic, cultural sphere, because of my country, Georgia, where I've seen this struggle in 2008, there was discussion how far we should interpret relief supplies after first month. Um, supply of food, medicine, moving hospital is okay. But when we talk about capacity building for welfare or broadly, um, you know, defining right um, to life and medicine, then it goes far beyond, you know, moving hospital. And there was a tension between the international organizations as well as parties to the conflict. Should we... Uh, consider this as a relief operation because as far as I remember actually some of the international organizations tried to push this idea and there was a battle not within the IHL realm but from the human rights interpretation perspective and it's interesting to, because there is no much written on that. That's a, a very good question and as you say the, the threshold of IHL is actually quite low in essentially it's essential goods essential for the survival of the civilian population it's really not a very high threshold um, and um, 
Obviously, it's just a bottom line, though there's nothing that precludes an actor who wants to try to carry out relief operations and beyond to try and persuade the relevant parties, can I also carry out these activities? Um, but they're not specifically addressed by the law, so the state would be entitled to not consent to them, not agree to them, even arbitrarily. They're not covered by the law. Um, I think you raise an important point in relation to, IH, uh, to human rights law, because I've always felt there was a bit of a, a disconnect between IHL that's, that sets a pretty high threshold of suffering. You've got to be starving before it would be unlawful or arbitrary to withhold consent, and human rights law, where, fine, we've managed it to narrow it down to, to rights to physical integrity, fine, also pretty severe suffering. But once you start looking at economic, social, and cultural rights, you, you're talking about an adequate standard of living, including food and water, health and medical services. It opens it out quite dramatically. I've tried to, to narrow it down by focusing on, on the core, I'm looking for the word, the, satis the core, the minimum core of these rights, but it's still pretty broad. So that's, that's just a, a question that sits uncomfortably, I think, between the, the potential range of rights and situations in which it would be arbitrary to withhold consent under human rights law and those where it would be uh, equally unlawful under IHL. We have to keep in mind that really the, the bottom line, when we come back to the principles, the bottom line for humanitarian action may be what, and I, I don't know if to what extent you will uh, agree with me on this statement, but uh, what qualifies relief action as humanitarian, including in IHL, is indeed this impartial character. So in our view, the bottom line for humanitarian action is definitely to respect those principles of humanity and impartiality that we have discussed today. In order to do so, well, within the ICRC and within the broader um, humanitarian sector, it's acknowledged that being neutral, being independent, is critical in order to, to achieve this objective of delivering impartial humanitarian assistance and protection. Um, and um, I'm missing the second part of, uh, of my idea, uh, but that indeed, as we discussed today, it requires some efforts from humanitarian, humanitarian organizations. It is challenging. Um, it is rarely a right or wrong answer, and it requires a lot of honesty and, and transparency by organizations in, uh, in doing so. So dialogue with all is critical in order to, to do so. It's not about lip service to humanitarian principles. It's about what you do, how you operate, and doing so in a consistent manner and with clarity so that everyone understands why you are doing something in a particular way or why you're not. I think that's the key thing to, to emphasize about compliance with humanitarian principles.